Hi, I'm Paul O'Mahony. I'm the director of Out of Chaos, and um, we're looking at Antigone, uh, which is a play by Sophocles. This workshop is is looking at a very small section of the play, only about sort of 60, 70 lines of the play, and it's a scene between Creon and Antigone. And what we're going to do is just have a look at the same scene, but in different ways, to explore how interpretation shapes a production and how through rehearsal, a performance gets built um, that can vary very differently from other interpretations that you might see. Uh, we want to start to look at the characters of Antigone and Creon and start to explore a little bit more about them, their motivations and the different ways that we can approach playing them. We've also got some incredible academics joining us who are going to talk to us about the play, its context and the role that performance has in understanding these ancient scripts and what they mean to us today. Well, up to this point, we've seen Antigone with her sister Ismene at the beginning of the play, where Antigone is telling Ismene about the decree which has said that Polynices is to be left out to the birds and the dogs, denied burial, whereas Eteocles is being buried with full rights and honours. And Antigone asks Ismene for help. Um, Ismene refuses. Antigone goes off. Then we see Creon, and it's a really interesting entrance that Creon has, because Creon enters talking about being the captain of the ship of state. And ostensibly what Creon says at the beginning of the play, and actually throughout most of the play, until we get really towards the end, makes a lot of political sense. He points out that there has been huge turmoil, internecine strife, civil war in Thebes, and that what you need is a strong captain who can steer the ship. And yes, that's leading to autocracy and potentially to tyranny, but put in the context of Greek states, well, you know, a tyranny isn't that unusual. Now for Athens, clearly, for there to be one man in control as opposed to the democracy is something which is uh, politically against the ethos of their state. But across the Greek states, it's not that unusual. It wasn't that unusual for Athens a century before Greek tragedy came to be born. So, Creon is not set up as a villain. And this is one of the interesting dilemmas that an actor and a director needs to address. Is Creon a villain? Is it reductive to be thinking in terms of Antigone as the hero, Creon as the villain? Well, further down the line, we see that uh, a guard comes in and explains to Creon that Polynices' body has been partially buried and there's an amazing description of what it's like for these soldiers out on guard. You can just imagine the stench from the corpse, the dust rising, um, and then the realization that a scattering of dust has been put on this body. Creon throws a wobbly, and this is where we start to see that his seeming rationality uh, is actually underpinned by a great deal of um, uh, lack of confidence, which manifests itself in anger, threatening that the guard will have to pay for this crime unless he's able to capture the culprit. Well, the guard comes back with Antigone, describes the scene of discovering her howling like a beast over the corpse, trying to rebury the corpse. And this is the precursor to the scene that we have in rehearsal, where Antigone is up against Creon. Creon is, uh, first of all, finding out the facts in a seemingly quite rational way. Did you know the edict? Did you know that you were committing um, a crime? Did you know what the punishment is? But then as we see through this scene, it becomes a dialectic between two very, very strong opinions. And you can actually look at this entire play saying that it's two people who are both right and both wrong. Hello, I'm Evelyn Miller. I am playing Antigone. Hi, I'm Tim Delap. I'm an actor and for this workshop I'm playing Creon. And you, now answer me and keep it short. Were you aware that doing this had been forbidden by the proclamation? I was aware. How could I not be? It was clear enough. And still, you dared to contravene the laws? I did. 
because for me, it was not Zeus who made this proclamation, nor did justice who inhabits with the gods below decree these laws for humans to observe. I have concluded that your edicts, as you are mortal, are not strong enough to override the statutes of the gods, which are unwritten and unshakable. These do not date, you see, just from today or yesterday, but live forever. And nobody knows when they first came to light. So I was not prepared to pay the penalty before the gods in breaking those. Not out of fear for any mere man's way of thinking. I knew I had to die for it. Of course I did. That did not need your proclamation. And if I die before my time, I see it as pure gain. For one who lives amidst as much distress as I do, cannot help but see death as gain. And so for me, this doom of yours is far from pain. But had I left the body of my mother's son unburied, that would have really hurt, which this does not. And if you think I am a fool for what I've done, the one who passes judgment on me is the fool. Well, let me tell you, attitudes that are too rigid will most likely come crashing down. An iron that has been forged to extra hardness you will see most cracked and splintered. I have known the most unruly horses broken with a little bridle, and rightly so, because big thoughts are not allowed in one who is a household slave. She showed her expertise with insolence back then when she defied official laws. And after that, here is a double insolence. She laughs and revels over what she's done. Now I'm no man, and she's the man, if this control of hers is going to stay unpunished. I don't know about you two, but I actually found that really, really interesting. Um, the fact that the actors were directed by Paul to do this in a low key way, um, if we were to sort of think about it, um, we would say, is that really this scene? But in fact, it seemed to me to reveal an awful lot. Lindsay, do you, do you agree? Yes, I found it really fascinating. I think what it really brought out was that this is at the core of it, a family drama as well that's taking place between two members of this very closely knit family. And that intimacy and that closeness that was brought up between the two of them, I thought really highlighted those aspects of the conflict. I think often with this play, we do tend to think of it in those grand, in those grand terms um, involving really big concepts, but playing it in that very low key way, almost making it smaller, I thought did bring out some of those underlying family dynamics, which are a key theme of the text as well. What, what came through to me was from the, particularly from the if you like the lack of the the, the the low volume of of crayon was a kind of menace uh, and it, it's a personal menace and that was seemed to me part of the the family dynamic uh the the personal threat threateningness that they have to each other they both threaten each other and i thought that particularly jumped out in in when crayon uses the word that is the greek word for a slave because we're in a slave society in ancient Athens, uh, where he, he um, uses that word in order to diminish her stature within the family, in order to drag her down as low as he, within the power dynamic of the household. I keep eye contact with her. Okay. When she's, when she's speaking. All right, okay. I think, if mu I think as much as possible. Okay, all right, yeah. Like, keep, keep that eye okay. contact. If you want to, yeah. like, a little bit. Yeah, but... But I think try and, oh, yeah. try and retain that so that then we have that real yeah. sense of breaking to yeah. the audience when we when we choose to. And it, it, I always kind of feel like, can we make that like a bigger 
like a more dynamic action. Mm. So it actually, like, we kind of step in. I don't oh, know yeah. whether that gets okay. too big there, but like, that we step in and say this thing to them, and, like, and then I come back, mm -hmm. and it just kind of yeah. makes the point. It makes the point, and I think also, like, it just gets it in our bodies as well, yeah. that there's yeah. this different yeah, kind okay. of dynamic with it. Yeah. And that's yeah. maybe... And almost, like, out of her earshot. Yeah. Or my earshot. Yeah, it, you know, it, like, it, could, it, could, it could have As that. if it's, like, it a slight... Like, like, can you see what I'm dealing with here? Yeah. 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 And if you think I am a fool for what I've done, the one who passes judgment on me is the fool. Well, let me tell you. Attitudes that are too rigid are most likely to come crashing down. And iron that has been forged to extra hardness you will see most cracked and splintered. I have known the most unruly horses broken with a little bridle, and rightly so. Because big thoughts are not allowed in one who is a household slave. She showed her expertise with insolence back then when she defied official laws. And after that, here is a double insolence. She laughs and revels over what she's done. Now I'm no man, and she's the man. If this control of hers continues to go unpunished, I do not care if she's my sister's child or closer kin than everyone who shares our household Zeus. She and her sister too will not evade the nastiest of deaths. I sentence her as well as being equally involved in scheming for this burial. Go summon her out. I saw her in the house just now, distracted and hysterical. The mind that's plotting wrong in secret often gets detected in advance. And yet I hate it too when someone, after being caught, attempts to paint their crime as beautiful. So is there anything you want beyond just killing me? No, nothing. Having that's my everything. Either she has passed the point of no return. She's, you know, she's, 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 had, she's had it with Creon. She is no longer interested in listening to what he has to say, to his opinions, to his edict. And she is, she's kind of gone beyond to the, to the next place, to the next world. She's for the people and then prepared for death. But it really does feel like there is another way of playing it where it is very important to her that Creon understands why she's done this. That it isn't spiteful, that it isn't an attempt to undermine his rule or emasculate him. It is what is right and what must be done um, to, to, to a level that, that's just beyond kind of any conversation you can have about state law or, you know, the laws of thieves. It's, it's, it was really interesting doing it like that. And I definitely think, I'm sure there are lines that I could have turned out to the audience more, but actually it didn't feel necessary. Yeah, it felt, it felt right in many ways doing it like that. It, um, the, his response to her uh, is much shorter. It does feel just naturally that, I mean, the way it's written, so much of it is not to her. Mm. So much of it is about her. And so lots of sort of doing that directly to the chorus, to the audience, to the citizens, mm. um, making an example of her because he has no answer for what she's saying. So he sort of has to take it away from her. I think, I think, yeah, in many ways the, the sort of the intimacy, the privacy, the close proximity of, of that version of it is quite unsettling for him. So he, he, he sort of turns away from it and goes to his slightly safer place, which is just to um, talk to his people mm. um, who he thinks and assumes is, are going to agree with him. Mm. Um, yeah. He, he, I, th I think I think it's quite kind of pressurized when he's having to actually look her in the eye. 
one of the lines that really struck me in that quite a more personal presentation was when Creon says that, well, Antigone says to Creon, do you, is the only thing that you want for me to be dead? And he says, yes, that's all that I want. Mm. And I felt that delivering it in that way, so directly to her face in that manner, made it seem incredibly personal. I, I see what you mean, Lizzie. I mean, that it's as if uh, the important thing is not to have her purged for him in that way of playing it. It's not to have her purged from the city, but to have her purged from his personal life. And I think that point gets brought out even more strongly in your translation, Oliver, when Antigone responds to Creon's long speech with, so is there anything you want beyond just killing me? And the way I think Evie delivered that here was really powerful and chilling, absolutely, because it is now reduced very much to a, a personal vendetta. One thing that, that struck me with, with this first interpretation of it was this question of who the audience is that's being understood um, because of the fact that they were really just talking to each other until that moment when Creon switches and involves us as the, the audience on camera. Um, and I thought that linked into this idea of who Antigone is trying to persuade um, with her argument here about the great unwritten laws of the gods. Is it Creon? Because he certainly doesn't seem to be persuaded at all. And in some ways, I wonder if, if, if that's acknowledged by Antigone that she has no chance of persuading him. Is it the gods who are understood to be present? Um, so I thought that taking away that strong sense of audience made it feel very intense. Um, in some ways, I think that actually focuses our minds more on, on those big questions rather than diminishing them. And in, in a performance of this kind, in that kind of space, uh, the eye contact and the, the direction in which the eyes are pointing um, came out very well and came out. And I mean, Paul drew attention to that in, in directing it. And I thought it was especially important. Mm. And, and even when um, uh, Tim came to the camera, it really made a difference as to where he placed his eyes, whether he was actually talking to you, Paul, I think as director, or whether he was looking at the lens. Um, yeah, I, I found that moment when he directly um, looked into the camera quite startling, actually, given the, the very intimate nature of the dialogue just before that, um, and the way that it suddenly brought us as, as the audience into being um, the addressees of, of his, his generalizations I thought was really quite effective. Okay, so we've looked at it now in terms of sort of having quite an intense, that sort of, sort of personal connection or at least an attempt at that from Antigone and then kind of a rejection of that with Creon. And in the way Creon, you've been kind of using the audience or the chorus in a certain way. I think now let's let's explore that for both characters much more fully. Mm -hmm. And that actually we now think of this, we now kind of place this in a very, very public setting. But also that you are both appealing directly to the chorus. Mm -hmm. And in a way by extension to the audience, I think, as well. And that you are it's almost like you are, yeah, you are kind of like you're committing to try and win their hearts and minds, that you are trying to win them over to your argument, that it's almost like a battle for, for sort of the, for the centre stage, down stage centre, to kind of be winning the battle of, like, of sort of who's going to back either your version of what should happen or your version mm -hmm. of what should happen, to really just bring them into play as the, the, as the other very, very significant presence in this scene. And you, now answer me, and keep it short. Were you aware that doing this had been forbidden by the proclamation? I was aware. How could I not be? It was clear enough. <laughs> and still, you dared to contravene these laws. I did, because for me, it was not Zeus who made these proclamations, nor did justice, who inhabits with the gods below, decree these laws for humans to observe. I have concluded that your edicts, as your mortal, 
are not strong enough to override the statutes of the gods, which are unwritten and unshakable. These do not date, you see, just from today or yesterday. They live forever, and nobody knows when they first came to light. Well, let me tell you, attitudes that are too rigid are most likely to come crashing down. And iron that has been forged to extra hardness, you will see most cracked and splintered. I have known the most unruly horses broken with a little bridle, and rightly so, because big thoughts are not allowed in one who is a household slave. She showed her expertise with insolence back then when she defied official laws. And after that, here is a double insolence. She laughs and revels over what she's done. And I'm no man. And she's the man. If this control of hers is going to stay unpunished, it definitely feels like there's so much of it that feels like it's perhaps performative is, is a bit of a stretch, but there is definitely something about there's an awareness and there's a real importance to the fact that we are surrounded by people who are judging. And I suppose in Antigone's case at this point, maybe the people who are going to be carrying the memory of her forward. It feels like there is definitely an element of preparing like you said, preparing her kind of story and legacy. There was there were some moments that felt absolutely correct, that it felt like this kind of personal almost, well, I mean, it's a family argument, isn't it? If you kind of strip away a lot of, you know, she's arguing with her uncle, but for a lot of it, it definitely felt like that audience was incredibly important. One, one thing I was very struck by in um, Antigone's performance in this more public version was the idea that she is constructing her own legacy here. She's constructing a version of her, her, a version of her story, which she wants to be remembered and not the version that Creon is putting forward, which is that this is um, a, a treacherous act, an act which goes against the city. And I think perhaps we're not often accustomed to thinking of Antigone in that way. Um, we perhaps tend to sometimes think of her act as something quite personal and driven by personal family convictions. But to actually think of her as memorialising herself through this speech, putting forward the version that she wants to be perpetuated, I think perhaps gives her a, a different stature in the way that this was played here. I think Evie used that word, didn't she, in the in the rehearsal? That was very it's very striking, um, particularly if you think that uh, Sophocles, it, as far as we can see, virtually invented this role. I mean, Antigone is his invention, and he sets her up to. Um, to gain a, a legacy of uh, immortal fame through her story. And of course, he succeeded. <laughs> well, I think it was, I think it was very revealing and, and um, made very good sense to home in on the one scene where Antigone and Creon directly confront each other. Um, uh, otherwise, you tend to see one the, them one by one rather than together. Whereas here they they face each other, and you get such an interesting dynamic because first both of them make their kind of statement. You know, you know Antigone's speech is longer, but they both make a, a, a kind of set piece in which they set out their position, and then it breaks into this dialogue with one line each, the, the Greek word for that is stichomythia, and in the stichomythia dialogue it's it's much more um, like sparring, it's much more like almost you know, something like a tennis match where it goes to and fro and to and fro and each answer answers each answer, so that it calls for a completely different kind of dynam dynamic in the language as well. Uh, as translating it, uh, I find that translating the stichomythia uh, pulls out a much more um, monosyllabic, much more um, repetition, much more picking up of the previous person's speech and so on. And it's, it's very good to see, to, to, to see the scene with both of these ways of putting things, both the, the set piece speech way of putting it and the um, tense to and fro fighting, uh, hand to hand fighting, so to speak, of the stick of myth here. Now answer me and keep it short. Were you aware that doing this had been forbidden by the proclamation? I was aware. 
How could I not be? It was clear enough. And still you dared to contravene these laws? I did. Because for me, it was not Zeus who made this proclamation. Nor did justice, who inhabits with the gods below, decree these laws for humans to observe. I have concluded that your edicts, as your mortal, are not strong enough to override the statutes of the gods, which are unwritten and unshakable. These do not date just from today or yesterday, but live forever. And nobody knows when they first came to light. So I was not prepared to pay the penalty before the gods for breaking those, not out of fear for any mere man's way of thinking. I knew I had to die for it. Of course I did. That did not need your proclamation. And if I die before my time, I count that as pure gain. For one who lives amidst as much distress as me cannot help but see death as a gain. And so, for me, this doom of yours is far from pain, but had I left the body of my mother's son unburied there, that would have really hurt, while well, this does not. And if you think I am a fool for what I've done, the one who passes judgment on me is the fool. Oh, well, let me tell you. Attitudes that are too rigid are most likely to come crashing down. <laughs> And iron that has been forged to extra hardness, you will see most cracked and splintered. I have known the most unruly horses, <laughs> broken with a little bridle. And rightly so. Because big thoughts are not allowed in one who is a household slave. She showed her expertise with insolence back then when she defied official laws. And after that, here is a double insolence. She laughs and revels over what she's done. Now I'm no man, and she's the man. If this control of hers is going to stay unpunished, I do not care if she's my sister's child or closer kin than everyone who shares our household Zeus. She! And her sister, too, will not evade the nastiest of deaths. I'll sentence her as well as being equally involved in scheming for this burial. Go summon her out. I saw her in the house just now, distracted and hysterical. The mind that's plotting wrongs in secret often gets detected in advance. And yet I hate it, too. When someone who, after being caught, paints their crime as beautiful. So is there anything you want beyond just killing me? No, nothing. Having that's my everything. What are you waiting for then? I have no liking for a single syllable you say, and trust I never shall. Just as I'm bound to keep on being disagreeable for you. And yet... What higher glory could I win than by performing my blood brother's burial? And all these people here would give me their approval were their tongues not clamped by fear. One of the great advantages of one man rule is the liberty to do and say just as you please. But you alone, of all the Thebans, see things in this light. These do too, but gag their mouths in front of you. And are you not ashamed to think so differently? No shame in honouring those born of one womb. Did his opponent to the death not share your blood as well? He did. Same mother and same father too. So how can you bestow a favour that besmirches him? The man who's dead will not support that view. Not even if the honour is equal to that filth. It was his brother, not some slave, who died. Out to destroy this land, the other stood in its defence. Yet Hades still desires these funeral rites. The good should not get equal treatment with the bad. Who's to say what's rightful in the world below? An enemy 
can never be a friend, not even after death. I'm bound by birth to join in love, not join in enmity. Then go below and love those there if love you must. No woman is going to be in charge as long as I'm alive. Yeah, it's really fascinating what it does to the scene, because I think the more aware you are of this audience, you know, made up of the audience or the chorus or whoever, the more tactical it becomes, the, 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 mm. the kind of rhetoric in there and the different avenues they both take of, you know, trying to maybe humiliate each other. It, it feels almost that the more public it becomes, the more vicious that private is, because that private is obviously still there. Um, yeah. it, it feels even less, perhaps, that you're trying to convince that person and more that you're just fighting your cause and your corner. And I think what really struck me about the more public um, performance was particularly on, on behalf of um, Antigone when she makes the claim that the citizens agree with her and they would support her if they weren't too afraid to say anything. And all these people here would give me their approval were their tongues not clamped by fear. That, that kind of direct gesture, public gesture to the audience. Is really canny on, on her behalf um, because by saying that they agree with her but they're too afraid to speak up um, means that we can interpret their non-reaction as agreement. So I thought that having that public nature of the performance really keyed into the strategy that, that she's using there, um, which is to claim the, the support of the citizens um, in a way which means that even if they don't actively voice that support, it can be assumed. I think that's really, really important as well, Lindsay, especially because we know what she says here to Creon is going to be picked up again or going to be echoed in the scene between Creon and his son, Hymon. When Hymon makes the point precisely that people think very differently from the way he thinks and he just needs to listen and he doesn't necessarily, well, he's not referring then to the chorus, he's referring to the citizen body more widely. So yes, you're absolutely right. And that really rings out loud and clear in, in this version. There, there was also a moment when um, there was a, a kind of smirk on uh, Antigone's face. Did, did you notice that? You will see most cracked and splintered. I have um, which 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 was very powerful actually, and and I'm thinking um, you were you know brilliantly uh, speaking, Lindsay, about the way Antigone is is constructing her legacy at this moment, and and of course you know expressing contempt for your in interlocutor. What what better way than than smirking? And that's. OK, that, that wouldn't be possible in, in the Greek theatre, but I thought came across really well here. So I think, I think we realised um, uh, in the public uh, version that um, it wasn't obviously just about eye contact. Suddenly, bodily, um, people could be saying things that, that really contribute to, to meaning as well. I thought there were a couple of places where Evie tipped her head back and drew her shoulders back uh, and it, it, as if to launch her point. Um, and uh, I thought actually how interesting that that particular movement of body language would speak in a big theater. And although this scene is played in, in a small space, that kind of throwing back, uh, I can almost imagine it throwing back to speak to the back row at Epidaurus, you know, it was, uh, it was a very powerful, um, body movement, I thought. As well as the, the smirk, uh, which I noted as well, I thought there were a few moments where Evie almost seemed as though she was on the verge of, of laughing at him. Um, whether that could be out of frustration or because the character genuinely finds his arguments risible, because to her they're so unconvincing. And I thought those moments where she seemed to almost um, as it, yeah, be on the verge of, of ridiculing him, of laughing, of, of being so obviously convinced that her stance was superior, um, were really effective. 
And I think also perhaps a reminder that, again, of this, this um, lack of connection that exists between the two of them, that, that there's so much at cross purposes that they may even find the other's stance almost laughable, um, not just offensive, not just wrong, but almost, almost funny because it's so wrong headed. I thought came through in, in those performance choices as well. There are just moments where Creon loses it and he sort of can't help but um, his, his kind of strong man facade uh, and his, his veneer of control just, just crumbles in the face of Antigone's um, stubborn, strong-willed kind of stubbornness. Mm despite his attempts at sort of crawling and like sort of, you know, he, he, he sort of almost, yeah, he sort of tries to joke with the audience, I feel, in some bits and then sort of like, you know, look at her, isn't she, you know, this is insane. I found that quite interesting at the end, because I feel like um, um, quite a lot of that bit that you were saying, um, yeah, Hades still desires these funeral rites sort of from there onwards. It was almost like the two of you stopped any sort of talking to each other. <laughs> and actually it was like you were talking to each other through yeah. through the audience yeah. instead. It was almost like at the end of at the end of a political debate where mm -hmm. you're now just like I'm I'm saying my my key slogans yeah, yeah. So for you to remember. Straight it, down right? the camera. Yeah. 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 And you were like and you weren't even it felt in a way like you weren't even interrupting. As a tactic as well, throwing throwing those last two lines, you know, you might think I'm a fool for what I've I've done. But if you pass judgment on me, you're a fool. Now go, say you yeah. It's like, it's Over so, yeah, yeah, it does feel so, in a way, like quite childish. Yeah. Because it's like, anything you say is stupid, plus infinity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we've seen in this film two very, very different ways of, of playing the same scene. And Jane, can I ask you now, as scholar, but also as practitioner, you, you're an actor, you're a theatre director, what other ways might we play this scene? I think for an actor and for any contemporary director approaching this scene, um, as we've seen in this, re this rehearsal footage, one of the really interesting things is how this text does not allow us to follow through with our contemporary understanding of naturalistic acting it simply doesn't work. It doesn't work because of the language and it doesn't work because of the setup. And many in particular younger actors find that quite difficult because they've grown up thinking about Stanislavski. So as we were having a look in the footage between the, the different forms of formal um, uh, dialogue, turning out to the audience, when the performers can interact with each other, there we see that there's a degree of stylization that can happen. The other thing that's interesting about this play though from a contemporary perspective is why do it? You know, there are so many reasons that this play is crucial, resonant for our times, for any time. But I think it's very important that a contemporary practitioner can really articulate the reasons behind doing this play. And then the next thing is casting. And it's a fascinating thing how you cast and how choosing different actors can give a completely different impression of the play. So the two actors that we've seen in this video are terrific, they're great. They can handle language, they can handle verse, they have incredible presence, wonderful. And I would very, very happily see production with these two in the leads. In the production that we had mooted, we couldn't cast Creon. We spent almost a year trying to cast Creon because we knew we had to have a star, we had to have an A-list Australian actor. And one by one by one, as we cast them, they would drop out to do a movie or to do a TV. So literally we got to two months before the show was to open and we didn't have a Creon. So then the director said to me, well, why don't do it as a woman? Now that, for me as a former classicist, is a red rag to a bull. You cannot do that. There's this Hegelian dialectic between male and female going on. You can't possibly have this tussle. 
we've been brought up as classicists or as young classicists anyway to think that this play for all that it was performed by men but this play because of the character of the woman and the character of the man and what the misogyny that Creon comes out with is absolutely crucially about the male female divide but gender politics have moved on so what if you actually have a female Creon uh, uh, think about the female leaders that we've had, Hillary Clinton or Angela Merkel or in Australia, Julia Gillard. Not so much Maggie Thatcher, but those three are really interesting examples because all three of them had to temper themselves again and again and again. They had to change the rhetoric. They were not allowed to use the performative language of the male politician. They had to find other ways, more cajoling ways, more maternal ways to express what they wanted. So I rewrote the character of Creon, bringing in much more of, a, of the, the background of Anwy's Antigone, which has actually very, very rational Creon. And I rewrote this character so that she was a political animal who had had to claw herself up as a woman through the political ladder, hitting the glass ceiling, trying to crash through it. And that made the scene very, very different because now you have Antigone's aunt, but a woman who is trying to hold this state together, and she might feel some compunction for her niece, but there is absolutely no way she's going to put what are supposed to be the female virtues of maternalism and compassion above the state. The state is the most important thing. I would actually say, think about having a female Creon. You have to change the lines. You cannot have a woman saying those lines. But what happens if you use the performativity of language that both these characters employ in a slightly different way so that the politics becomes um, less black and white? Mm -hmm.